maybe what you wanted us to take away from it, or would you expect um, us to go to the TA hours? I think you can start with the TA hours, but um, I can tell you, I mean, if you give it to me, I can't even tell you what the concept I was expecting you to take away from that. Uh, so, for instance, I mean, it's problem number one is basically for you to be able to calculate these numbers, get a sense for what the built-in potential, um, you know, how you calculate what it depends on. Uh, problem number two is for you to see that this, this thing is actually real, the distribution of the charge, just due to diffusion. If you have a source and a sink, it will become a triangular <coughs> distribution as opposed to a uniform distribution. And do we, it's also, you will see a look at the dynamics of build-up, how it builds up when you start it and how it dies out, or how it kind of equalizes out or what. You can play with that actually more when I mean, you can add more parts to it yourself. Problem number three is basically, it shows you a real application of how you can, by engineering the profile of the doping in a diode, you can design a barrackter that has a certain property that allows you basically to get linear uh, frequency dependence on the voltage if you are designing a VCO voltage control oscillator. And problem number four is basically to take you through the calculations for a very basic model for a JFET. Mm -hmm. So it basically shows you how a JFET works. You know, we, we don't have time to review all kind of devices at all time. Uh, so some of them you get there as homework problems. But if you get the basic concept, you're basically using the width of the control that you have on you know, the width of the depletion region mm -hmm. through a voltage to get the, to control the current that flows in the part that's not depleted. Okay. So, so this is kind of these things. And, and in this problem, as they said, I'm, just kind of, I'm not going to repeat what I just said. So these are the kind of things that I want to take away. Part of doing these problems is to also get a sense of what, what the numbers look like in the field for an orders of magnitude, because it's very important to know what these orders of magnitude are and what these numbers are. It's not just a matter of calculating it. It's important to know how big or how smart, small they are, because that allows you to make the right approximation. So when I make an approximation here, you would say, mm, that doesn't make sense, or that does make sense. So we can know this thing was, when I did my calculation, it was so much four orders of magnitude larger than the other term of the rock. So it's a combination of things, because eventually when you get to design, what you will see once you get to design, design is an inexact science, or it's not even a science, it's an exact art, right? And, but it's an art that's based on the science behind it. It's like painting, I mean, this is the example I will use. And we'll see real examples of it as we go through the course. You can paint in so many different ways. You can look at the same scene, I mean, every single one of you can draw it or paint in a different way. And all of them are good and valid. Design is like that. You can come up with different designs of all that are valid and good designs. But to be able to come up with one of those among the infinite upon infinite number of designs that you can that exist, you have to know what the limitations of the, of the devices are, what the constraints are, and that's the science part of it. And we'll see many examples. So we are start, right now we are starting with the kind of the basic underlying science behind it, and then we'll go and apply this in the design. But now when you go to design, uh, when you, go to design you, you need to know, you need to be able to think about these devices like a transistor as a, more of an abstract unit, and you don't have, want to be tracking every single electron in them, or even flow of electrons. You want to create a new level of abstraction that allows you to deal with a, um, with a transistor as an entity that you can think about in a certain way. Say, oh yeah, if I do this to a transistor, this is what it does. <coughs> But you have to know what it relies on and what the limitations of those assumptions are. And we'll see more examples of that later. Any more questions? All right. In that case, let us continue our discussion. So, what are the, so last time, what we did, we arrived at the model, the ever small model for the transistor, for the transistor right? So what we did, we said, well, so at low frequencies, please, look at the bipolar transistor. Let's say, in, in this case, an NPN. And if it's a PNP, the polarity of these two guys will be reversed. And so you have two back to back guys, which is not the surprising part. I mean, NPN structure, the NPN structure gives you that. Um, and then you have two dependent current sources that were controlled by the current through these uh, diodes. So we call this IF, the forward current. current so we called it, uh, let's just make sure this convention is just I think I called it I, E, S, and R, let's see. I, E, S, E, to V, D, E, over V, T, 
where Vt was Kt over 2, which was approximately 25 or so, more active, 25 or 0.6 millivolts at 300 Kelvin. And then there was the reverse current, IR, which was ICS, E to VBC over V. And these two dependent currents were alpha F, the forward alpha times IF, and alpha R, uh, IR, which was the reverse alpha. And we saw in a properly designed transistor, because of the way you handle the doping level, you, your alpha F is close to 1, and your alpha R is generally smaller than 1, sometimes substantially. Okay, so that was the basic model of the transistor. So this 
So in the forward active region, you have something like this, for the transistor. And this was uh, IV, which was IS over beta, P2, VBE over VT, and this was beta IV. That was the pi model, and we had the T model that looked more like this. Which was basically half of the ever whole model. Small 
actually this shouldn't be partial, but there are no other variables. So it's D I D D V D. And what is that? Well, I can easily calculate it's the derivative of this thing, which basically gives me I S over V T E to V D over V T. And I realize that this term is nothing but the I I D itself. The current, the operation current. So it's the DC or quiescent ID over VT. So you can see I have a resistance or conductance, which is the slope of this line, that depends on the operation point. So the larger the current, the operation current is, the larger this conductance will be, the smaller the resistance. If I'm operating at zero current, it will be zero. But it's a useful quantity because if I have small perturbations here, I can translate them to small perturbations here to a linear transfer function, which is basically just cheat this gain. The small signal relationship, in other words, in that, in those terms, I can easily say that ID is G times V. And G is calculated from that. You agree with this? Not that surprising, right? Now, so going back to the question of what is the resistance of this dial, the on resistance of this dial, with the caveat that it can be only defined around an operation point, it is 1 over that G, or BT over ID in this case. And it depends on the operation. Now, that's the very basic concept of the small signal model. Now, we, what we'll do, we'll apply it to the transistor and come up with an equivalent small signal model, which is a linearized model around the point of operation. But you have to realize, be able to come up with the right parameters for that model as well as this model. First, you have to know where your operation point is, your quiescent current. That's why you first need to calculate your operation point, your bias point, and from that, calculate all these other parameters associated with the small signals. So let's do it for the transistor. Well, here or there? Oh, let's, let's put it there. Let's start there. And, um, Now, and then you have 
let's say you have some fixed voltage here. Now, what it means is that now if you introduce a small variation, VBE here, you can expect to see a current that has two components. One is basically the original ICQ, the operation current, when you didn't have this, I mean the quiescent current, when you didn't have this um, perturbation, plus a small perturbation. But now, if you are interested in the ratio of these things, let's say you're trying to amplify an AC signal, you're really interested in the ratio of these things, so I'm really interested in knowing what IC, lowercase IC over lowercase BB is, which is nothing but GM. Okay? And I'm sorry, if you're, uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this concept already, but I just want to make sure that there's no, there are no gaps, because it's a very essential to a lot of things that we'll do later. So it's important for, it, for us to make sure that we are all on the same page. So that's the good part of the transistor. So if I, and how would I model it? Well, basically, if I want to make a small signal model, like this pi model, for instance, or the T model, well, let's, let's do it here. Well, I can use a current control current source, I'm uh, sorry, a voltage control current source. So this is GM. This is my collector, this is my emitter, and this is my base, and this is VBE. So, so far what I've shown is this model, right? This, this is exactly, this represents exactly that. So the voltage between the base and the emitter, the, vari the small signal voltage, the variation of voltage, results in a small signal change in the current in the collector. And you can see in this model, you basically taken out the DC part. So these parts do not appear there because this is a linearized model. And when you calculate derivatives to linearize it, the DC parts disappear. <coughs> Therefore, in a small signal model, whenever you have a power supply connected, a DC battery connected to a point, from an AC perspective, from a small signal perspective, that's a short. That's zero. And we'll see that very often. Now, it's conventional to call this, instead of VBE, just V pi, because this is a high of pi model. GMD pi. It's just a convention. Very often. So this is the good part of the transistor. This is the use of the, this is the transistor part. This is the, now, everything else that we we'll derive from here are parasitics. And there are a whole lot of them. There, there are elements that are not useful to what you want to do. They actually degrade the performance of this transistor. Almost without exception. This is the only part that does something useful. There's one good guy and many bad guys. Um, we'll have to deal with those, understand what those are and how, we, how they affect the performance. So that's the most basic. Now, what else do we have? You can see that I have a diode between the base and the middle, right? That's forward bias. So it shouldn't be that surprising that I have some sort of small between the base and the base and the emitter, right? Here, between these two terminals. Because I have an on diode connected between. Right, that diode. So what is it? Well, again, I can calculate it by um, <coughs> here. I can calculate that by again the same method. So let's call that well, whatever it is. What is it? So it's the derivative, the conductance between those two is the derivative of I B, the base current, with respect to the base emitter voltage. Right? It's the, the slope of the line. Uh, of the curve uh, showing the VBE or IV versus VBE, right? The variations of the base current with the voltage across it, right? So it's like a diode. The terminals are the same. <coughs> now, actually, we define the reciprocal of this one over that R pi by definition, because that has units of conductance. If I wanted to find a resistor here, it has to be one over that. And what is this? What is the IV? What do I know about the relationship between forward active region? What do I know about the relationship between IB and IC? What is it? What is IC in terms of IB? Beta. beta times IB, right? So I can rewrite this as, well, DIC over DBE divided by beta, beta DC. 
right? Which is basically the, you get the beta out. And if you take the beta out, what is this quantity? D I C D D E. GM. We have already captured that, right? It's G M. So it's beta over G M. Now, so there's a resistor here. So it's not an open circuit like that. It's really a resistor R pi whose value is beta over G F. Or beta times V T divided by IC. The quiet current. So that's a parasitic component. Why is it a parasitic component? Because ideally I want this to be what? In infinite. Because the, the larger, the smaller this resistor is, the more current I have to put into my base. But this current is wasted, this doesn't appear there. Right? For a given voltage change, I have to put more current into it. So I have to be able to drive the current into it. And you can see in a MOSFET, pretty much it's in an open, the way it is. Because in MOSFET, there's no gate current, unlike the base current that we have in the bipolar current system. But it's one of the parasitic components. What else do we have? Now, we also notice one more thing. In the expression we have for IC, we have a second term, the early effect, right? So that should appear as something. So what did it appear as? What do you expect it to appear as then? In a, in a small signal, perturbational, incremental model. Yes, it's a resistance between which terminals? The collector and the emitter, right? That's VCE. See, the current of this terminal is, is affected by the voltage across these two terminals. So if you have a current that depends on the volt voltages across the same terminals, which is a resistor. So what is that resistance? How do I calculate it? So that, that resistance is, well, that conductance is DIC. So the resistance associated with it is 1 over that, and we call that the output resistance, or RO, by definition. And what is that quantity? Uh, the well, I have to differentiate that. Differentiating that is very simple, right? What I see is that I get 1 over VA, and approximately that becomes basically uh, IC Q. Oh, I'm sorry. It becomes VA. Over IC. Or ICC. When I see, okay, it's ICQ really the quiescent current. But let's agree on a convention to keep it consistent with the book and everything. So from now on, whenever I show a quantity, a lowercase quantity like this, with lowercase indices, it refers to small signal quantities like VDE and IC. Whenever I show a quantity that has everything is uppercase, like that. It's just the DC part. And if you, I want to show the combination of the two of them, both, both the large and the sum of the voltage, the, the total voltage, it's an uppercase quantity and the lowercase subscript. So that's a convention. Use it in your book. I'll try to follow it. Sometimes I may not. Just I'll do my best to follow it to keep things consistent. That's a reasonable thing. Now, so let's put this third component there. And we know this, this is not even, even that is not exact, right? As we talked about the last time and earlier today, that's the first term of the Taylor series expansion associated with the output resistance. But it doesn't matter. We're going to linearize it anyway, so we might as well linearize it from the beginning. So these are the three components that we most often use. This is the transistor action. Now, this is the output resistance. And this is the input R pi resistance. Now, what, why is this R, R O a parasitic component? What would it affect? I mean, you want it to be as small or as large as possible. So let's take it to the extreme. What if it's zero? What happens? It's really small. Yeah, it shorts the current source, right? So there will be no current provided the outside circuitry. Every all the current will circulate inside the transistor, so there will be no variation of current. Here. So you, don't, you get zero gain. So you want it to be as, as large as possible, so you don't want this to steal as much of uh, uh, you want this to steal as little of the output current as possible. Now, in addition to these three that we most often use in our calculation, there are other terms in the in the in the transistor. So we'll talk, let's talk about them a little bit. Now, if you change the voltage, now these are 
So these are, let's say, this is a zero order effect. This thing. So if you want to do a very quick calculation of how the transistor works and all this, this is the only thing you need to put in here. Small signal model. These are the first order effects. Now I'm going to show you some second order effects and then some dynamics. Now for the second order effect, one of the interesting things is that when you apply a voltage between the collector and the base, right? What happens is that you are changing what? You change the collector base. If you apply it, this change the reverse bias on the base collector junction. What happens? You change the width of the effective width of the base, right? The part of the base that is not covered by the diffusion region. Now, if I make the base thinner, when I make the base thinner, what happens? I may increase the probability of the electron making it to the collector, right? And that's why you have this term, this early effect, this term, right? Up there. But now, one of the things you need to know is that, okay, when that happens, still the ratio of the collector current to the base current is more or less fixed. It's kind of big, right? To the first order. We'll talk about that in a second. So that corresponds to an increase, that has to correspond to an increase in the base resistance. Right? So there is a change in the current between the base and collector really, associated with the voltage change. So I'm looking for a resistor here, which is called R mu. Now, this R mu, by definition, is D I D, the D D C D. Right? And I know that I can rewrite this as, so I can rewrite the D I C over beta, so the beta comes out, D D C D. Okay? But now, what can it, what can you tell me in a forward in forward active region about the relationship? And B, C, E, this voltage. The collector base voltage and the collector emitter voltage. The difference is one BBE, right? BBE on. But it's on if, if you forward active region, by definition, it's on. So it's either 0.7 or 0.68 or 0.72. So it's not going to change a whole lot. So approximately, this is the same as DIC, BBCE. And why did I do this? Because this is the quantity I've already calculated. What is this? It's RO. So this is beta RO. So it's a very large quantity, in fact, based on this calculation. And, and there's a reason for it actually even larger, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, so let's look at, uh, now, the reason it's even larger, in practice, it's actually much, it's going to be about up to an order of magnitude even larger. Than that. Now, the reason is the following. Remember the base current had two main components. What were the two main components for the base current? Why did you have the base current? One was to make up for the lost electrons that were injected back into the emitter. Right? And that process was captured by numerically by the emitter injection efficiency gap. There was a second loss mechanism for the electrons that had to be compensated by holes, which was the recombination in the base. Okay? So when you change the BCE, what you affect, you affect this ladder process. You reduce the width of the base, the effective width of the base, so the, the chance of recombination goes down. So that component of alpha is affected by this process. But would it also affect the back injection of the electro holes into the emitter? Not a whole lot. There's no reason for it, right? It's only shrinking the width of the base, but still, when injected back, in, so it's only one of those two components that's affected. So therefore, the, the, the change in the current for a given change in the voltage is even less than what you expected. In other words, you have an effective resistance that's larger than this. So in practice, even, it's even larger than that. So now let's look at some typical numbers. Again, let's do refresh your memory. Some ty typical numbers here. So for GN, let's say a transistor is operating. This is a good number to remember. If, it, if your transistor is operating at 1 milliamp, So what is the GM? It's 1 milliamp divided by 25.8 millivolts. Let's say 25 millivolts. If you assume 25 millivolts, it's 1 milli divided by 25 milli. It's 40 
million zenas, which is one ohm or ohms. So this is, a, let's say, at IC one milliamp, and room temperature, the 300 Kelvin, GM, approximately 40 milli zenas. Sometimes people show it with milli mo, whatever, mo, whatever, how you pronounce it. It's the opposite of ohm. This is all Siemens we use usually much have many Siemens. So uh, so it's 40 million Siemens uh, at one million. So if you know that you know I probably my class four million four instead of 40 million Siemens, it's four million Siemens and so on and so forth. So just to get it idea. Now, how about our pi? Let's say beta, let's say approximately around one month. I mean, it can vary, as we know, and it changes with temperature and device parameters and all those things quite a lot. But let's say a typical beta of 100. And depending on the kind of transistor, this may be a reasonable number. So if it's a beta of 100, and it, let's say at 1 milliamp again, at 1 milliamp IC, what is the R pi? What is the resistance? It's 1 over GM, so 1 over 40 millisiemens is 25 ohms. And so that times 100, so that's about 2.5 kilo ohms. How about RO? Well, I have to give you a typical number for VA. VA typically 50 to 100 volts for some typical integrated transistors that we have today. So let's say VA of 100 volts. Um, add that divided by 1 million, an IC of 1 million. You got 100 divided by 1 million, that gives you 100 kilo. So RO is going to be around 100 kilo ohms. It's quite a large resistance. And how about R beta RO? This R R mu. It's huge, right? Even if you ignore what I told you about the fact that it's even larger than that, sometimes about 10 times larger than that. But even if you ignore that, it's going to be beta times that, so it's going to be about 10 mega ohms. So you shouldn't be surprised that in practically all of the calculations we do, none of the calculations we do we actually use that R mu. We rarely use that. Okay? So, now, these are the intrinsic resistors of the transistor, right? So, if I ask you, for instance, are these real resistors? No. These are just slopes of lines. And that's why, when we later on, for instance, talk about noise, these resistors don't generate noise. These are not physical resistors. They're just slopes. These are just derivatives. Right? Now, but in addition to these intrinsic or incremental, well, in intrinsic and incremental resistors, there are some physical resistances inside the transistor, right? Because, for instance, you're, it's made out of pieces of semiconductor, and semiconductor has resistivity. We calculate that depends on the doping level. So, there is really a resistance associated. There's the intrinsic resistors. Well, I'm sorry, extrinsic resistors <coughs> associated with the transistor. So, the most important one. Usually the largest one is the base one. We show the RB. Now, this is the physical resistance of that thin slab of semiconductor that forms the base. Okay? Now, why did I say base is the most important one usually? The base physical resistance. Well, first of all, it's like the current has to go from the emitter to the electric through the base. If the base resistance is very high, then wouldn't that affect the energy? Uh, not exactly that way. See, because think about it. If, if, if this is the transistor, right? This is the base. The current is flowing in this direction. So the resistance it sees in this direction is not very dark. But the base resistance we're talking about is the resistance for the current flowing in this direction. Right? So it's not exactly. But the thing is, the base is thin. Right? So the base is thin. So this resistance, first of all, is the largest of all. So in that direction, it's large. And usually that's where you apply your input, your VBE. So if you have a drop, let's say the resistance, if you pass a current through it, you will have a voltage drop. And therefore you can lose your signal. Or if it has noise, which it does, it's a physical resistor, it gets amplified through the exponential function. So this is the important. Now in addition to that, of course, you have the collector and the emitter resistance. But now out of these two, which one do you expect to be larger? R E or R C? from the discussion we had about the transistor and how it's built. RC. Why? 
Yeah, exactly. RE, the emitter, was the one that has the highest level of doping. So it has the lowest resistivity. So RE usually, you rarely see people capping RE. And RC, sometimes, yeah, but RB is the most prominent one, usually. So these are the physical resistors in the transistor. So you sometimes have to, be, you have to take them into account. Okay. Yes. Now, in addition to these, so, so, so far, everything we've talked about have been low-frequency static effects. Now, in addition to these, you also have some other things in your transistor. First, is, to, be, to begin with, you have junctions, right? You have two division regions. One between the base and emitter, and one between the base and collector. Now we have already calculated, the, we have demonstrated the fact that this shows this has a capacitance. There's a junction capacitance associated with each one of these junctions. So there are two capacitors here we have to take into account. Well, where are they? Well, let's start with the base collector one. It's between base and collector. So it's here. So this is really CJC, the, junk, the, the collector junction capacitor, right? Junction collector capacitor. But often we actually show this uh, with CMU. Because it's impaired with RMU. Now, there's a second one. There's a base emitter junction, right? And that, junction, that depletion region exists there, even if you forward bias that junction, there, there will be a depletion region. The depletion region doesn't go away. And there's a junction capacitor there too, which is CJE. <coughs> so there are two capacitors here. But now, in addition to these, there's another charge storage mechanism. In addition to the, these two junctions, the depletion region, there is, was one more charge storage mechanism that we talked we talk about last time. You remember when we were talking about the dynamics of the transistor? We said that there is a buildup of minority carrier charge in the base, right? QF. And we said what? We said the collector current, IC, was simply QF over tau F. Or tau F was the average time it took an electron to get from one side of the base to the other side. And QF was the average charge. So if you have an average net charge of QF, and it takes an average of tau f to go from one side to the other, what you actually get is a net current, which is the ratio of the two. Now, so I have charge in the base. So this is a, another capacitance. Sometimes it's called the base capacitance or the diffusion capacitance because the, the, these electrons travel from diffusion. So it's not charge, it's different mechanism, it's different charge storage. And actually, in many cases, this is the dominant mechanism for charge storage. So, but how do, I get, how do I translate it to a capacitor? Where would that capacitor be? It's a capacitor which is basically between, it's controlled by the base emitter voltage, right? This charge is controlled by the base emitter voltage. And what it affects is the current in the base, because that's what provides the charge to this capacitor, the charge of this charge, change QF. QF is a charge of the base. So base current and the base emitter voltage are the ones that are affected. So I really, what I'm interested in is to say, well, CB is really DQF DT. Right? Does that make sense? It's an incremental capacitor again in the way I define it, right? But and what is that? Well, QF is IC times tau F. So I can write it as IC tau F, DBBE. And if I assume that tau F 
in the ratio of I, the lowercase ic, the small signal ic to small case id, and I define that as my beta as a function of frequency. So I want to look at this beta, this new beta, this ac beta, as a function of frequency in this configuration. Right? How do I do that? Well, I know all I'm caring, I, all I care about is are these small signal quantities, so I might as well go directly to the small signal above and calculate the uh, ratio directly by, by applying the small signal model. So I can start linearizing the system from the beginning as opposed to going through the nonlinear equation and then linearize it. And that's what we'll do when we use the small signal model. So let's draw the small signal model for this. So let's draw the small signal model for the transistor. So I have the R pi, and this terminal is ground, so it's just basically the emitter is ground. So anything that's connected to the emitter is going to be connected to ground. And I, let's ignore these physical resistors, in this case you will see RB doesn't matter, I'll show you in a second why, but let's ignore them for, for a second. And let's ignore RMU, we know that that RMU and even RO, because those are large resistors. If you don't ignore them, obviously, let's, let's see what happens if you don't ignore them, but let's look at the important parts. So this is the uh, GM V pi, so this voltage is V pi. Right, this was my emitter, which is connected to ground, so this is ground. Now, where is my, and let's, let's just for the sake of argument, keep R over here. Now, what should I connect this? I have, in the real circuit, I've connected this to a battery. From an incremental, small signal perspective, what is it? What are the changes on that voltage? A battery, by definition, has a fixed voltage. So any derivative we calculate of a fixed quantity is zero. So all this fixed 
Thank you. 
And as a result, your FT grows with the current. So you increase your current, you get better FT. And that's really not surprising because basically you're increasing your power consumption. There's a trade off between power consumption and speed, and we'll see this many, many times when we get to circuit. But it really boils down to how much current you have to drive. GM is the strength of your drive, right? It's a current source. The more current you have to charge and discharge capacitors at any given time, you can just charge and discharge them fast if the capacitors are fixed. So it makes sense in that sense. The more current, the faster. But it's not infinite. At some point, this term becomes this term becomes dominant. And when this term becomes dominant for some GM, this term doesn't matter. What is it? The limit. It's one over tau f. You can't go above that. So it starts, it plateaus. So according to the simplified model, it should plateau and stay there. But in reality, what it actually does, for a real transistor does, is this. It goes down. So there's an optimum current for maximum FT. And of course you can, you can be certain whenever you look at a data sheet or a design kit or Found me to report it. Yeah, this is a 100 gigahertz FD transistor. You can be certain that this is for the smallest transistor under the best of the conditions at this point. They expect it at that, of course. It's marketing. Um, so you have to realize that it doesn't mean that you can't get 100 gigahertz FD under all circumstances. But anyway, so why does this happen? Let's talk about that. Can you think of it? I see the collector current. Okay. And this is the FT, the cutoff frequency. So why does at very high current the FT drops? Why, why is it that it drops? Uh, no, not necessarily. No, no. Well, let, let's say we keep the transfer at a constant temperature. It's in contact with a fixed temperature reservoir. We don't need to worry about that. I mean that could affect things too, but contacts are substrate effects? Um, no, 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 again, those are not fundamental. This is a little more deeper inside the transistor, the way it happens. But uh, those could have a secondary, effect, secondary effects, but even in the absence of those, you see this very, very uh, explicitly. Oh, yeah. The mobility decreases, right? The mobility. First of all, why do you care about mobility? Where is the mobility in this equation, anyway? Yeah, it's in, in the, it doesn't show up in the. So you think about it, this is actually the bipolar transistor does not depend on mobility to first order. Think about it, it's a thermal device. It's a, it's a diffusion-based device, right? It's, it's a minority carrier device, by the way, I'm saying. It's just a random thermal movement of these minority carriers. It's not a drift device. I mean, MOSFET is a drift device, but it's, it's not there in the bipolar. Yeah? Your face capacity. Not exactly, no. It's, it, all of these could be secondary effects, but there's a first order effect. You remember here I made an assumption here about tau f being constant when I went from here to there? Tau f actually drops at very high current, but why? That's the important thing. Think about it. What if this happens? You are injecting a lot of electrons from the emitter, they go through the base, and they end up in the collector, right? Now, when you increase the current, what are you doing? What, you're increasing the number of electrons at any given time. Now, the assumption we made in our calculation is that these electrons do not interact with each other. Right? So if you have a low number of electrons, electrons behave independently, so they are randomly thermally moving, and then every so often they end up in the collector-based depletion region, and they are sucked into the collector. But now, if you have a very large number of electrons in that depletion region, close to the collector, that has a negative charge. That has, that's what they call space charge. That negative charge repels additional electrons. So you can have so many electrons in the collector that the negative charge of all this kind of electronic cloud, electronic mass that's kind of moving towards the collector can repel new electrons. So it, it creates a repellent force. That's called the space charge effect or Kirk effect. It looks like a back pressure or something? Kind of, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And you see, that's more pronounced in a vacuum tube. Vacuum tube, they're actually saturated because of that. And you will do actually a whole problem of vacuum tube in some way. You have a vacuum tube calculations. But um, 
this space charge, there's so much charge in there, like back pressure, right? And there's, they push it back. And that's why tau f actually gets larger. Tau f becomes larger because of that. Because it takes longer on average for electrons to get from one side to the other because of this repetitive force. It's harder for them to move. And therefore, Cv becomes larger. 